My name is Peggy Clark. I'm with the Aspen Institute. Uh, this is a fascinating group of people that we have here today, so I'm delighted that you could join us. Um, this topic of resilient health systems, it seems that the world just this year is finally waking up to the nature of the crises that are before us. Um, with the Pope's encyclical, I think we all uh, were called to a kind of a understanding about the forces that are influencing some of the major disasters we're facing in the world. Certainly the Ebola crisis brought uh, a poor African communities and what we were witnessing in terms of the uh, disparity and lack of health systems to our front doors, um, and it became an issue for us all. To the water drought in, in California, um, and I think thinking back to one of the things that inspired Judith Roden's book on resilient, resilience um, was Hurricane Sandy in New York City, which really shut down one of the largest metropolises in the world. So what are resilient health systems? Um, what does it mean in terms of cross-sectoral approaches? What does it mean in practice in both the US and globally? We have a fantastic panel, which I'll introduce as I, as I call on them. But let me just first start by calling on Mike Myers. Mike is, Michael is the managing director of the Rockefeller Foundation. He has worked um, for a number of years on some critical health systems issues, including leading the work on universal health coverage. Um, he spent most of his career with Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, and so uh, he led on the work with, health, uh, with the Health Committee under Senator, Ten Senator Ted Kennedy's leadership. He previously worked on refugee and international humanitarian affairs. And I had the pleasure of having Michael with us in our first Ideas Incubator, which was looking at reaching the, the last mile. Um, and Mike, I wonder if you could start by telling us what is a resilient health system and why does it matter? Sure, thanks Peggy. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, let me start, if I could, with a very brief story that takes us back to the year 2003. And that's when Liberia came out of, of two civil wars. They were determined to make economic progress to rebuild the country. They were making major advances in the field of health. They were, they were on track for, to achieve the Millennium Development Goals set by the global community. And on a couple of them, at least, they were the first country in Africa to achieve them. So they rightly felt proud of what they had accomplished, and we all supported that and cheered them on. Then Ebola came, and as the new Minister of Health of Liberia, Bernice Don, explained to me at that moment, all of their work at that point crumbled. It was like dominoes. You know, once you, when you were playing with, when I play with my children and lay the dominoes on the floor, you tip one and the whole thing goes down. And the reason was they had great achievements in these silos, but it wasn't integrated into a system much less a resilient health system. Now, as we're dealing with rebuilding in Liberia and other countries, as countries who watch the Liberia crisis unfold and are looking at their own systems, the word resilience is being thrown about with wild abandon. And some people know what it means, others don't. So we've tried it at, at, in our work at the Rockefeller Foundation to bring our knowledge about resilience that we've developed over many years working on climate change and economic downturns, and how does that, what have we learned from that work that could be applied to health systems to make them resilient? So that's what we're, we're engaged in now. And if I could quickly just Please. pose five questions that we've um, come up with for, that you should ask, whether you're, if you're a minister of health or you're working on a specific health program, should ask, you know, does, it, does this project, does this overall work answer positively these five questions. So question number one is, is your system aware? Does it know what the challenges out there might be? Does it have a surveillance system in place that people like Larry Brilliant uh, know so much about that can detect what's coming? Um, does it know its strengths and its weaknesses, the, what kind of people it has on its staff, what kind of people it doesn't? Is it aware? So that's one question. A second question is, is it diverse? And by that, I mean, does it have, nobody does one job. When challenges come, can you redeploy people? Can you redeploy entire units and elements of the system to answer the call? So is it diverse? A third question is, is it self-regulating? Do you have to go to Congress, Donna, in order to make the changes that you need 
um, to, to make the adjustments that, that adapt to your particular circumstances. You shouldn't have to do that in every case. It needs to be self-regulating, and you need to have set up your health systems and your, your assets, your infrastructure, your quarantine facilities, and so forth in such a way that you can, they can kick in almost automatically. Is it self-regulating? A fourth feature, a fourth question is, is it integrated? And this one's very important because it's not just integration of the elements of your health system, but it's integration with the broader uh, world that may have some relevance to health. People in communications, people in the private sector, community groups, religious leaders, have they all come to the table? Are they all integrated in some way that builds trust that's so essential to the effective functioning of a system? And then the final question is, is it adaptive? Can it really change the circumstances, both in bad times and in good? So I propose that if, if you can answer those qu five questions positively, you've not only got a resilient health system, but it'll pay dividends to you in good times as well as the bad. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me ask, uh, turn to Larry and Donna Shalala and just introduce them uh, briefly. Donna Shalala, many of you know, um, is the president and CEO of the Clinton Foundation. Now, welcome to that position, I think, just a few weeks now. Uh, um, and Donna was, of course, the president of the University of Miami. And she was President Clinton's Secretary of Health and Human Services. She also led the University of Wisconsin at Madison and Hunter College of City and University of New York, among many other distinguished things. She is as well the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, among numerous other, other honors. And our other distinguished panelist is Larry Brilliant. Larry, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, there's surely no one who's worked more on these issues than you. Larry is the senior advisor at the Jeff Skoll Group, chairman of the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Um, he has been quite involved in a number of issues, particularly the smallpox, smallpox bioterrorism unit. Um, he was the executive director of Google.org, among many, many, other, um, many other important, important areas of work on this area. Let me ask you, Donna and, uh, and Larry, is this notion that Michael's putting forward just another construct from the ivy towers of the Rockefeller construct, uh, Foundation? Or is this a real concept that makes sense in life? Donna, for you and your various roles, working to promote health for all. And, and then also, Larry, um, when you reflect on the Ebola crisis and smallpox. Donna, let me start with you. What do you think? Real oh, construct? I think it's real. I, and I'd use another word, nimble. Mm -hmm. because we're really talking about organizations that can adjust, not just to crisis, but to getting better. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of nimbleness that you want um, in organizations. The one thing I didn't know anything about, by the way, I knew about crisis management before I went to Florida because I lived through eight years of government, but, <laughs> but I didn't know about hurricanes and how states and and cities and, and governments, and I was running a huge healthcare system, including our relationship with the great public uh, hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, Florida is extremely well organized mm -hmm. for hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And the nimbleness is built into the structures, into the institutions, the decision making mm -hmm. system is in place. Mm -hmm. We train and train and train people to adjust to those kinds of crises. But the most recent crises, of course, are the economic ones. Mm -hmm. And that is how to, and Ebola, because every part of the healthcare system, but the economic ones have hit the healthcare system and our ability to redeploy people, to eliminate positions, to make hard decisions. I mean, universities are a little like the Catholic Church, they move a little slowly, um, particularly because they have a locked in uh, group of people who have something called tenure. But to, to take a large, complex research university and make it a resilient organization is what's absolutely critical to get high quality health care, mm -hmm. to get high quality education. And all of the elements, the questions um, that we just heard apply to different kinds of organizations, whether they're government agencies mm -hmm. or whether they're universities or whether they're large, complex healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're moving in that direction because we can't afford to have silos anymore. Right. So the silos you, are real problems when yeah. you have to respond. So as you take the helm at the uh, Clinton Foundation, 
uh, deep sets of work in health and environment, all separate from each other. How will this concept of resilience affect how you work at the Clinton Foundation? Ah, what's more important than that is what happens when Mrs. Clinton gets elected. <laughs> <laughs> My assignment. Are you going to tell us? Tell us. No, tell my us. assignment over the next year and a half from the Clinton family is to anticipate the future. Whether she gets elected or doesn't get elected, I have to anticipate the future. So awareness is an important element. Awareness. So awareness is a very awareness. important element. A very important element. Yeah. So my job is to break down the silos, but also to, to focus the organization, to make it more nimble, to make it more responsive. Um, and, uh, uh, and that may mean that, at, and to change, we're changing the way in which we make decisions, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it grew very fast without the kind of infrastructure that it needs. And mm -hmm. Judith Roden and I have right. talked about that at right. some length. So um, it's the smallest organization I've ever run. I've never tried to make a small okay. organization <laughs> resilient. That's so interesting. Um, well, to that point of, uh, of, of uh, but I want to hear what Larry has yeah, to say. Exactly, because Hillary these guys you to predict the future. define the terms. I just sort of right. live them. No, that's right. I mean, talk about predicting the future. Let's turn to Larry Brilliant, uh, the, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. Um, right here. You know, Hillary's asked Donna, "What's the future look like? What should the Clinton Foundation uh, focus on?" Tell us from your perspective. President Clinton has. President. Yeah, Clinton. Mrs. Clinton has gone off to the campaign. Okay. All right. Forgive me. Right. Tell, tell us your That's thoughts. That's why she survived so long. She's really good. <laughs> right. Give us some of your thoughts. Well, on can I start off with an advertisement uh, for the Rockefeller Foundation? Because this, oh. this idea that you began with, little tiny one, I know there'll be objections. Um, you, you know, Rockefeller basically started the field of public health. Uh, I don't know that the young people here, which is everybody except me, knows about that. Uh, started the entire field of public health yeah. with the Flexner Report, uh, did the first eradication program of hookworm, and has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. And I, I was once asked, uh, I don't know if you know Hans Rusling, who yes. does these wonderful, he, he invited me to come speak at the Karolinska Institute, and like every good Swede, he was so polite, he met me at the front door, and as we're walking in the door, he took me over to the shrubs, that were by the beginning, the opening of the door, and he pulled away the shrubs and he cut away a little bit of the earth, and there was the foundation stone that they had put in when they, when they laid the stone for the Karolinska, and it said, a gift of the Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. And I think that's a different kind of resilience. It, it's, it's duration, it's stick to itness. Um, I was in uh, Kyoto in Japan, and I was at a Zen monastery uh, when I got a copy of uh, Judy Roden's book on resilience. And I was sitting there, and the monks had pools of different depths. And they would take a stone, and they would throw it in a pool that was very shallow. And the pool would ripple quickly, very disturbed. And they would do it in a, a pool that had a medium depth and just a little plink. Then they'd throw it into a pool that was very deep, and you'd hear almost nothing. That's resilience. When, when you think about how the British were after bombings, that came during the Second World War, their response was to have signs that said, keep calm and carry on. They weren't hyperbolic. They didn't have anaphylactic shock. They didn't exaggerate. Their Twitter feed didn't go ballistic. The 20 billion tweets and Facebook's postings every day didn't feed off each other and create hysteria as we did here with Ebola. We are a country that has the most resilient economy in the history of the world, and I'm afraid that we have the most fragile psychology, and social network. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about resilience, you can't just talk about one system. Yeah. And you certainly can't just talk about a medical care system, mm -hmm. let alone a, a health system. Mm -hmm. They're derivative of the civilization in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. And I look at those civilizations that have survived, the ones that have survived generations, they've been the most resilient. Mm -hmm. And I look at those who have been flashes in the pan or rocks in a shallow pool, and they've been the least resilient. So when we talk about resilience, we need to talk about the total system, mm -hmm. not just the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We need to really dig deep ourselves and think about the philosophy of, of why do we want to have resilience mm -hmm. for the safety and security and continuity and consistency mm -hmm. and justice and fairness. All these things are all mm -hmm. 
intertwined together. So let me ask um, all three of you this question. The health and the environmental movements do not really work well together. And you know, my husband's an environmentalist. I work often on women's issues. He starts every single statement with, when the world reaches 9 billion. I said, well, if you just provided family planning, it wouldn't reach, the, reach 9 billion. You know, there are issues related to the health influence the environment. And, and certainly now, most of the crises that we see in health are, have such an environmental component. Why is it so difficult for us to think about integrated systems? And you've mentioned um, silos, Donna. Maybe do you want to start and address? Well, I think that they had different cultures, different funding streams for one thing. And, and, and the people that started them did not originally came out of health. Mm -hmm. If you look at the origins of the public health system in this country, the way in which we extended life was clean water, clean air, building codes. It was essentially an environmental base that we built um, our healthcare system on. It was the first public health departments were called sanitation departments. So they, they started out together and then in many ways went off. They're coming back together. I just sat on the panel, the risky business panel with a bunch of business people. And the whole section, the former dean of, of public health at Johns Hopkins and I uh, sat on, uh, there are whole sections about the environmental impacts on health uh, in, in, in that report. So I think they started out together, they separated, and now they're coming back together. Do you think that's true, Michael? I, I do. I think Donna's absolutely right about that, that, and I'm very hopeful about the coming together that we're beginning to see in the United States you got now the Sierra Club talking to health people, and that wasn't happening before, and really highlighting the human health impact of uh, power plant rule and things of that sort. Climate change. And climate change, yeah. all of those, and I think that's all for the good. One thing I hope does happen uh, from all of that, and we're working on that now at the Rockefeller Foundation with a lot of others, is to really integrate that more, more clearly. So bringing together what we know about environment and its impact not only on the earth, but on humans, bringing to, with it what we know about public health and human health, bringing that together in what could become a new field, a, a new way of thinking about solving problems. And I could imagine a future in which if we're working on something like malaria, that in, instead of coming in with just bed nets, part of the solution with this new lens would be plant trees while you're at it or don't cut down the trees in the first place. Or save the oceans. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, uh, my school of oceanography and atmospheric science does whole panels on human health mm -hmm. related to the oceans and, and uh, to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so I see it at least at the intellectual level being integrated with people coming together for the first time yeah. to talk about it. But I think people forget that we started out that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's We yeah. extended more That's right. lives That's right with uh, that combination, clean air, clean water, sanitation, and eventually vaccines, mm -hmm. than we have with all this high tech mm -hmm. no, that's right. yeah, I, can, can scientific investments. I, uh, I don't know how many of you heard the panel yesterday uh, about Obamacare, uh, the passage of the Supreme Court decision. Senator uh, Frist uh, was on that panel, and he said something at the end which I found uh, very compelling and a great reminder. He said, Obamacare is now law, Let's not quibble about how we got here. Let's fi fix it, make it better, whatever, but it's the law. But let's always remember that all of the medical care system accounts for less than 14% of life expectancy, of life, the quality of life, health issues. And, and you know, it's, it's important, I think, for those of you who are physicians, and if you were like me, when you went to medical school, our school was literally the ivory tower. We were on a hill. We had full funding. We could do almost anything we want. And then down in the valley where you know, the housing was cheap was the School of Public Health. And then way off the, pet, off the campus, you know, where, where you know, it used to be cornfields, there was the School of Environment. When I give commencement speeches at the medical school, I always begin by saying, I think that the medical school should be a department of the School of Public Health. And when I give a talk at the School of Public Health, I say, I think the School of Public Health should be a department of the Department of, of, of the School of the Environmental Sciences. I think we've, we've got it backwards. And as long as we have it backwards, that 14% is going to dominate everything. You're not going to have a resilient healthcare system when you have fee-for-service medicine and when medical care 
dominates the entire public health and healthcare system. So we, we've got we've got to look at the holistic uh, picture so Barry, as we talk about. So when you think about the breakthroughs that you've been a part of, certainly um, almost eradicating polio and being there, seeing the last case of smallpox on the earth, was resilience a part of the efforts then? Um, Tell us how this construct we're discussing now of integration relates to those experiences you had. Um, you know, in a way, whenever you're doing a vertical program, which is what smallpox and polio right. and um, certainly were, they, they are uh, the programs that are desired by the, the people who have the marginal, the greatest marginal cost of that disease continuing, which is usually the rich countries. Um, I don't think that smallpox eradication and polio really are in the same universe as the question of resilience. In fact, I'm not so sure they were really a very high priority. And by, if you think about it, uh, of necessity, they are the highest priority for the world, but they're not the highest priority for the last country that has it. By definition, Pakistan, which is virtually the only country with polio right now, uh, if you're honest, you can name 25 things that are more important to, to Pakistan right now. Yet, for the world, eradicating polio is desperately important. We'll never eradicate another disease if we don't do it. So if you're asking, were those campaigns important for world resi resilience? Absolutely. But if you're talking about the countries in which the last campaigns took place, I couldn't honestly say that. But childhood vaccines mm -hmm. were important for this country in terms of resilience, mm -hmm. because it was an underpinning for the entire healthcare system. When um, we took office, the Clinton administration, only 47% of the kids in this country were getting their shots on time. Yeah. Wow. And when I called the public health people together in a room much like this, um, I said the president's assignment to me is to get all the kids their shots on time. And one after another, the public health leaders uh, stood up and said, you can't do that because you don't have universal health care. Parents, it's expensive. The parents don't know, you know where to go. They have to go to public health clinics. It's, um, there's just no way to do it. And they said they usually get their shots by the time they go to school, so forget about trying to get them um, before they're three. And I reached into my purse and I pulled out a postcard that my golden retriever had just gotten <laughs> from his vet. And I said, look, it says, Dear Bucky, it's time to come in for your next shot. <laughs> and I waved it at these public health geniuses. And I said, look, if the vets in this country who don't have universal health care can get all the dogs and all the cats and all the sheep and all the cows vaccinated mm -hmm. and their regular vaccinations on time, we can build a system. Mm -hmm. And we, in fact, built a system over a four-year period. Um, it wasn't as ad hoc because what we did was get the health care system to understand that that was their responsibility. Yeah. Could, could I comment about Please. this? Because when we were doing the smallpox My dog Bucky program, got an award um, for... <laughs> when we were in the middle of the smallpox eradication program in Bangladesh and India, vaccine coverage was 20%. Under five children who were vaccinated right. against killers and cripplers, one out of five. Mm -hmm. T today it's four out of five, in large measure because of the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. In large measure, that is the major contributor to the increase in longevity in those countries. Yeah. And most importantly, it is probably the second most important contributor to the decrease in population growth in those countries. Mm -hmm. If first is the girl because effect, the kids will live girls' longer. education. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the kids live, if you, you're a parent and you watch your children survive those childhood diseases, they don't die at five, you don't lose. Remember, if, if the under five mortality is 50%, it means 50% of your kids die. That means you think 80% of your kids die. That means you have insurance births and lottery births and replacement births. And that's the accelerator for, for growth in most countries. Mm -hmm. So the vaccine program, the, the vaccinating children against childhood diseases next to girls' education is the single most important birth control measure that we've ever had. And a resilient system takes all of those things into account. That's why when you talk about smallpox or polio, I'm a little bit reluctant because it's only one component. It, it, it's more dramatic and exciting but it's only one component. And I would bet, Donna, when you did your immunization program, you didn't just have people show up at the door with a syringe in their hands. No. That it, it, so the point is that what we were talking about, breaking down silos 
including other other capabilities that you have within your right, system every in order to make it happen. Department, exactly. And we use the private sector extensively. McDonald's printed the immunization schedules on their trades liners. Um, I got Gerber's to put it on the back of rice boxes, um, their children's right box. But we everything we could think of, we got everyone in ride. And along the Mexican border, the Mexican health minister and I ran the campaign together during the same four week period in Spanish. Wow. So, but there wasn't, it's called the boom boom theory. That is, <laughs> you take an issue and then you take the institutions and you organize them and you go at the issue from every direction. No kid can walk into a hospital without, in their community without the hospital being able to look up the schedule and see if that kid who's hanging out with their mother who's going in for service had gotten their shots on time. And you had to build trust in the community and all that. And we got the Congress. The only thing we asked for Congress is bring down the cost of drugs, and we asked the pediatricians in the country to start giving kids shots. That's great. So, so let's talk um, about the stakes for not having resilient health systems. And I think it, nowhere is this more noticeable than in the recent Ebola crisis. And uh, Michael, tell us about that one child, little boy in Liberia, um, who was the first case in Liberia. and. It begs the question of a resilient health system needs to work for everyone. And it's to your point, Larry, of uh, early diagnosis, early detection, which implies a very far-reaching, very equity-based health system. Tell us about Liberia case that Peggy's you mentioned. Peggy's prompting me on a story we both heard earlier this week that's just fascinating in Liberia. And as I mentioned earlier, when in 2003, after the civil wars, and Liberia was rebuilding itself, including its health system. It had a goal of, of spending $44 per person within their health system. And they, they were moving toward that in major parts of the country. What they found out after Ebola hit, when they got some additional data, is that the part of Liberia where that sentinel case, this three-year-old boy who was the first to have to, to know to, to have the Ebola uh, virus, that part of the country was getting only 76 cents, not $44, but 76 cents per person toward health. Mm -hmm. So that, that points to that point of in, in our, our resilience principles that I mentioned earlier, being aware, mm -hmm. being aware of what's going on in your country, being aware of what assets you have or don't have to respond to it mm -hmm. and being able to adjust mm -hmm. in, in order to but deal with it. Doesn't it imply that there needs to be a community health worker force in mm -hmm. some of the, you know, certainly in some of the uh, sub-Saharan countries, and then also in that the US. does more than one disease. Yes. yes. Well, so but, what but does me, it require? Let me talk about the flip side of that yeah. because in Nigeria, there were less than two dozen cases and less than eight deaths okay. after an importation, and Ni Nigeria didn't go the way that Liberia went, and you know, part of the reason it's a richer country, but, but I, I would say there, there's five more important reasons why it didn't. First, it was the last country in Africa to eradicate polio. Mm -hmm. So it had a huge number of polio workers, and their actual designation was polio surveillance workers. Mm -hmm. They were out there every day, knocking on every door, looking in every gutter, trying to find polio. They were on a state of hyper alert for what a disease was, and they could recognize the disease. Mm -hmm. When they heard in the neighboring country, that there was Ebola, they immediately started looking for Ebola. Yeah. So you had the resilience of being able to transfer their job description, which is really important. Mm -hmm. Second, you had uh, a Twitter system, a, a digital disease detection right. system, an alert system. We don't have anything that good in the United States. Yeah. And the moment there was the rumor, in fact, we don't realize that it was the, the actual case of e Ebola into Nigeria was about the 10th rumor of Ebola that was put on this system yeah. where people would go out and look for them, sending the polio workers. Right. We also had three CDC installations that the CDC Foundation had put in place there. So you had CDC epidemiologists. You had all the experience that we've had from working in Nigeria and other diseases. Mm -hmm. Nigeria, for purposes of Ebola, was a resilient healthcare mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. resilient healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Liberia, mm -hmm. Guinea, Sierra Leone were the opposite. And I think if you compare and contrast those, then you can dig into this meaning of resilience. So what kind of investments need to be made to address this? I, I, I do believe that um, building from the community level up 
is the way to go in, in building a, a health system, but a resilient health system. And using modern technology, the IT. Exactly, the that's a, a big the, part of it. All these so yeah. what is it that's needed at that community level to address whatever, not only day-to-day -day health uh, within the community, but threats that may emerge? And from that we, comes the building of supply chains, supply chains, having hospitals in place, training the right workers, uh, working with the private sector where it's appropriate, uh, bringing in, um, working with the community leaders and, and others as part of the, an ongoing discussion about the health of the community. But I really believe building from the community up is, is very, very important. This came home to me uh, a few weeks ago when I, was, I had a, an opportunity to sit down with 28 ministers of health to talk about those resilience ideas that I mentioned earlier. They all liked it, by the way. But their, 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 their bit of advice was to start at the community level. Yep. And that's what a lot of them are beginning to do now. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, one example of where that's being tried in very bold ways is in Ethiopia, if we want to look at a case study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, that's not a new idea no. to start at the community level. I was a Peace We've Corps volunteer them. in the 1960s. What country were you in? And um, in Iran. Oh, wow. In Iran. And, uh, one of the things that followed the Peace Corps after our first year there is the Shah, wasn't a great fan of the Shah, put community health workers all over the country. And one of the things they needed to focus on, he thought, was family planning. Iran to this day has one of the best family planning systems in the world, but they built a community health system from the bottom up uh, in Iran. So in many ways, it's the old point for US aid mm -hmm. was to build from the from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you talk about um, infrastructure in healthcare, it's not very se sexy. Yeah. You should try to testify before Congress <laughs> trying to describe <laughs> why you have to put infrastructure in place and tracking systems. And But I think modern technology has made this easier in some well, ways. I, I think that if yeah. you look at um, the ASHA program in India, mm -hmm. Which is a tremendous Bill Drayton's program. Yeah, it's a tremendous. No, no yeah. not 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 Ashoka. Not Ashoka. No, the Asha program, which is a government program, a hundred million dollar mm -hmm. program. Oh, okay. To I put know what a, it is. a health yeah. worker in every panchayat, which is mm -hmm. usually about five villages. Um, that, that that is an amazingly successful program, even though it's a government down top down program, mm -hmm. but it's a bottom up program. You compare that to the Felcher program in Russia, which was a total failure, the Barefoot Doctors in China, which has left almost no residual, mm -hmm. and go back to when we first started talking about community level workers mm -hmm. in WHO, the slogan was health for all by the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And unless I've got my numbers wrong, <laughs> we got to the 2000 without the health for all. Right. And so we have to be careful. We've got to be honest about what our goals are, mm -hmm. because our goal really is health for all. We probably shouldn't put a target on the date. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at the experience we've had with community health workers, why it works some places. You know, there's a lot of incentives, economic incentives in the Indian program. There weren't in any of the other programs. And they, there's outcome they pay, incentives. They get their payroll. They get their payroll. They get their payroll. Some and you, yeah. you know what else? They, they, they don't have 89 things to do. They've got six or seven core important things so to do. So the scope of they practice can be accountable. is That's right. It's, it's, it's measurable. It's, 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 not, it's not just a, an aspirational goal. It's, mm -hmm. it's specific, and, it's, and the, the victories are hard won. Mm -hmm. And I think as we talk about resilience, the thing about resilience that's most important is it really is outcome-oriented. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, Donna, when you and I spoke before, you said that, that the key is the linking of health to other areas. And for the first time, there's a, a global health security agenda very much related to the worries you have about pandemics. And you, Donna, talked about, you talked about linking it to transportation, that they very often a resilient health system has interventions that are not about health. Is, is, speak a little more about that. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. If you can't get to the healthcare system, you can't. Um, if you're not culturally sensitive in the healthcare system, I mean, there, there are so many elements that bring in other disciplines that are critical to delivering uh, high quality healthcare, and we sometimes miss that. Mm -hmm. uh, we miss the specificity of how different groups have to be approached in different ways. In the other panel, I, I told the story about flu shots. We were trying to get all Americans flu shots in um, 1994, I guess it was. We decided Medicare could cover all the flu shots. No problem, the elderly would sign up for flu shots. Um, and it didn't happen. 
And so like a good government agency, we spent a million dollars running public service campaigns. I think we brought it up about 5%. Like a good social scientist, I suggested we go out and talk to people. So we did focus groups. We looked at, we, we actually went out and talked to people. Here's what they said. You would have never predicted this in public health. You had to get your flu shots in October. Mm. The federal fiscal year begins October 1st. That's when the deductible for oh, Medicare okay. begins. Oh, so the $100 deductible at that time, the senior said to us, I saved my deductible for something important, mm -hmm. like you know, going to a hospital or something. So we exempted the flu shot from the deductible and we got the take up. That's amazing. Now who in a public health school in this country would have connected have the federal fiscal year, the deductible, right. with, with behavior right. on yeah. flu shots, which saved hundreds of lives yeah. all over the place. Yeah, I want to make sure we save time for it's questions. It's a classic story. And, um, yeah, it's a story. I wanted to turn to, uh, to each of you to ask about the urgency of this. Um, certainly, Larry, when you and I were talking, um, you were really, really scary. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there is no question that the urgency of the, of, the, of the effects of climate change are affecting us all and human health so seriously. Why is this an urgent issue? Tell us why, um, Michael, the foundation's focusing on this and, and how you personally feel about it in terms of for, that question. For me, it's, it's, it's two things. One is we've seen the dire consequences of failure mm -hmm. of health systems with the Ebola crisis and so many others. So we never know when the next crisis is, is right around the corner. So being prepared for that, there's a, there's a fierce urgency of now to quote someone famous uh, about getting to, to that business. But second, I feel like we have here a, a bit of a moment in which the world is still somewhat focused on what happened with Ebola. It's, it, that, that moment is closing fast. So it's, a, it's an opportunity and a, and a quick opportunity to have this conversation about what, what we really mean about building a resilient system. Otherwise, what I'm already beginning to see happen is that people are going back to the old ways of just, if we just have this and that and that, these capabilities in silos, then we're fine. And we know now that that's not the case. Yeah. I agree with that. I, you know, if you think Ebola was scary, wait until you see what's coming behind mm -hmm. it. Um, and uh, one of the things I fought for at the end of the Clinton administration was to put a health person at the National Security Council. Oh, because I once debated Jean Kirkpatrick on whether health was a national security issue. Yeah. Wow. Years later, she said I was right. But it was in part because of the AIDS crisis. Right. But we've got to see this in its broader implications. And that is, this is not this is an economic issue, it's a national security issue. And unless we build these systems, mm -hmm. we're all at risk. Mm -hmm. These diseases have no idea whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or what country they're in mm -hmm. yeah. at the moment. And, and even if it's a one-off in one hospital in the United States, mm -hmm. you've got to be ready for the next thing that's going to come along. Right. So both in this country and abroad, this is critical to our survival mm -hmm. as a world. As a world. Larry. So I'm thinking of two different people, Jared Diamond, who's a medical anthropologist, and, and the Pope Francis. Yeah. Uh, so Jared Diamond and I were on a panel, and we were all asked about this fundamental question of, you know, is the world ready for the next pandemic? And he said, hell no. We're running out of all of our systems. We're running out of water. We're running out of arable land for food. We're running out of ingenuity. And most of all, we're running out of time. And Pope Francis' encyclical pretty much said the same thing couched in, in, in a proactive terms. He said, you must care for the earth. We're running out of water. We're running out of land. We won't be able to feed ourselves. And we're running out of hope. And, and I think those two things are the, uh, the field in which the next virus will be planted when we look at a pandemic. The worst thing about a pandemic, and we've discussed this in several panels already, we're going to discuss it again uh, tomorrow. The worst thing about a pandemic is despite the major tragedy being how many people are killed and how many are out of work and how many are harmed, first, the first number of people who are hurt are those who can't get to healthcare systems for something else. You always lose more people in a developing country from malaria and measles than you do from the disease, cause, and from heart attacks because it can't get to the hospitals that, that are taken over. There's no surge capacity. Yeah. And then you look at the other systems. During a pandemic, who's growing food? 
Who's thinking about buying next year's seed crop? Who's digging wells? Who's dealing with the impact of climate change that's literally salting the water that's used for irrigation, reducing the crop yields by 50%? Who's thinking about replacing that? Who's dealing with the educational system to bring you the next generation? Who? Everything stops. So the impact of a pandemic is on the most vulnerable system in the community that you're in. And if we look around, we are awash with fragile systems. That's the thing that we talked about. And, and that's why a pandemic, even if you can stop it early, if it accelerates fear, if it accelerates hopelessness, mm -hmm. if it accelerates panic, can destroy all those systems. Could I ask uh, these two gentlemen yeah, a question? Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's not simply the collapse of healthcare systems. It's the, the point that you made about the one-offs, the, mm -hmm. if you're just looking at one, uh, preventing one disease. We've done that in the fragmentation of the international health organizations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is we built a structure, it's a point I made earlier in a panel we were on, in which the World Health Organization doesn't do AIDS, tuberculosis, I mean, uh, some of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been sexy to create separate international organizations. And doesn't that add to the problem? of resilient, building resilient health systems? I think that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and, but I do feel there's a growing awareness that we can't just do disease-specific work anymore. We need the broader systems to support that. Mm -hmm. And so you, you see, for example, a number of organizations now that are, that are emphasizing that, even within the foundation world, looking at building up health systems more broadly so that you can deal with no. HIV, AIDS, or measles, or malaria, whatever it may be. Uh, the institutions, the institutional organizations haven't quite caught up to that change in the field, I think. Right. Yeah, I, I think we've got a, a bigger problem. Uh, after the Second World War, that war was ho so horrific. The, the visual imageries of, of people dying in the concentration camps and the effect of the war, it was so horrible. There was a consensus on the planet, we don't want that anymore. And we had the incentive to build these incredible, wonderful institutions, the World Health Organization, UN, the World Bank, the IMF, Bretton Woods. We, do, we need to have something that reorganizes yeah. our global governance of health at least, if not everything else, with the same order of magnitude of conviction. Because if you look at Ebola, and you look at MERS, and you look at SARS, you look at H5N1, you look at all of these diseases, the world is, you can almost feel it as if these viruses are jumping around eager to get out. We've got to be ready for that, and the only way we'll do that is if we change the structure of global health. Right, absolutely. Let's turn to the audience. I think we have some microphones. If you could raise your hand. Uh, and uh, we have right here, Esther, I believe that's you. You were the first hand up right there in the middle of that row. Thank you very much, I'm Esther, and I also am a Clinton Global University commitment mentor. And uh, my question is, what role do we, the young people, especially, you know, they, we have, what can we do to help build these resilient systems in health? Because I know you're talking about institutions, but where do we come in? Thank you. Good question. Would you like to take that, Don? Well, I think you're the next generation of leaders as you enter health professions. Um, you need to do what you're doing here, and that is understand the bigger picture as well as, and, and become leaders in your own country to make these points over and over again. You need to run for office. You need to go into the health professions. For you need to organize your own generation. Um, you're much better on Twitter than the rest of us are. <laughs> but um, I think what you can learn from other young people in other parts of the world is critical. But we're really, we're not handing it off. None of us are into handoffs. But we're really counting on you to do this much better. And I think it's fantastic that Esther is even asking the question. Absolutely. I mean, to me, that gives some hope, a lot of hope for the future. I'm betting on you. If I'm going to Las Vegas and I'm putting my money, I'm putting my money on you and your generation. You're the you best educated in the world. <laughs> putting his money on you. You're the best educated in the world. Wherever you live, you have a window into the whole world through the internet. You know places and things 
that my generation never learned about until we were too old to do anything or even visit that, those places. Mm -hmm. You are the best skilled, the best prepared generation in human history. And we're leaving you a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. But you're up for it. Yeah, just Your so you training know, well, is up for it. Esther and I'll is bet the first, you. Uh, first female scientist uh, um, who, from Kenya who received a patent. And she works on soil science and microbes. Mm -hmm. And she's absolutely at the intersection of soil health and human health. So you're, you actually are making a good bet on this one right here. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, in the back there. Hi there, thank you all so much. Um, so I'm Molly, I work with an organization that works in last mile community health. And my question is really, what do you see as the role of the private sector and particularly public-private partnerships? And you know, if you wouldn't mind commenting as well on what you think makes those kinds of partnerships successful in these um, endeavors to create resilient health systems. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to tell you about a private-public partnership to me which is incredibly inspiring. It's, it's a very large one. It's called CORDS, Connecting Organizations of Regional Disease Surveillance. And it has in it 27 governments represented by their health ministers. So you've got governments, that's the, the public sector. It has three UN agencies, WHO, OIE, the Organization of Animal Health, and FAO are members. It's got four large foundations, including Rockefeller and Skoll and Gates and Foundation Monroe. And then it's got 100 NGOs that are representative of CDC, other bilateral organizations. It is the best example that I know of a kind of extra governmental public-private partnership that is taking responsibility for organizing the world's disease surveillance systems because there are so many gaps in those systems from other agencies. And it was the creation of one person who just decided that we needed to have something like that, a fellow named Dave Heyman, who many of you know, yeah. who just said, you know, we need to have something like this, and he went about putting it together, the NGOs and the government. And it, one person, one small group of people, as Margaret Mead mm -hmm. said, can do a tremendous amount from a perch in the private sector as easily as from a perch in the public sector, maybe more easily. Many of these breakthroughs are public-private uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, the first big breakthrough with the Clinton Foundation was in the cost of drugs yeah, that's right. yeah. that's right. that Chai did. Um, and that was a partnership between the pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and a an, uh, non-governmental organization. In this case, uh, it was Chai, which is an affiliated now um, with the Clinton Foundation. It was inside at the, at the time. But there are lots of those kinds of examples. And I think most of us believe that the future is in these private-public partnerships, that we can't run in another direction any longer. It's not going to be government and the NGOs. It really is going to be either tripartite or, 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 or two or three or four organizations. I think in terms of the, the private sector, one thing that's important to keep in mind is to think of the private sector in terms of its capabilities, its capacities. We have a tendency of just thinking of the money. Can we get money for what we want to do? But they're amazing capacities. And an example I was thinking of earlier, Larry, when you were talking about Nigeria, that in addition to tapping the networks they had, the surveillance capability around polio and shifting it, what they also did was they tapped the private sector. It was a private hospital where the first patient was. And, and more than that, the president of the country asked the private sector to bring in the hazmat gear, the PPEs, and other things that they needed because he, they, he knew that they had the capacity to buy it in Europe and get it there fast. But so some, think about it in terms of their capacity. Sometimes the health industry. breakthroughs are the simplest things. 40 years ago, I was sitting in a village in Kenya with one of my college classroom mates, the, the widow of the great Tom Mboya. Pam Mboya was my classmate. And we're sitting in the village, and we're in this deep conversation about the women's movement. Her mother came in and said, women's movement, she said, what changed the women in this community was that well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, we used to spend four hours a day yeah. just going and getting water. And it actually was a private sector uh, initiative mm -hmm. in that community. But she said, it transformed our lives and allowed us to send our daughters to school and did all sorts of good things for the community. And she talked about the health of the community related to that well. I'll never forget that story. That beautiful story. We were having these big intellectual discussions, <laughs> and she was. So bring us some water. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question. Anyone? 
Hi, thank you. Thanks for this uh, panel, it's fascinating. We've heard so much about information technology for health and apps that have the ability to uh, significantly improve surveillance and uh, health outcomes. And um, I'm just wondering, there's so much uh, inaccessibility to the internet, and if we believe that health is a human right, is it soon to follow that access to internet becomes a human right? And uh, what's being done to ensure that those oh, wow. that are hardest to serve? Boy, that is Larry. The world has changed. Yeah, this, this is Larry. This is Larry. This is Larry. <laughs> now, let me repeat that. Because Seated the answer to you, the, the Larry. The question yeah, is, are we reaching the point where the internet is so important in, in health mm -hmm. that the right to access to the internet is the same or part of the right to access to health? Actually, I think it's going in the other direction. I'm sorry to say that the internet, which is based on full, free, uh, and equal access in a flat way around the world, and is predicated on that, is becoming balkanized. There's soon going to be a separate internet in the Soviet, in former Soviet Union in Russia. There's soon a separate internet uh, in uh, China. The Indians are talking about having their own internet. Uh, the Germans, because they're angry, I think rightfully so, of the NSA eavesdropping, and the fact that all the German email traffic comes through a US-based server are thinking about a European internet. Brazil is thinking of it. So within the internet community right now, there's centrifugal forces that are challenging even the access that we have. That doesn't mean the last mile or the Wi-Fi or the broadband feed won't be increasing. It's that what you'll be able to get from that feed will be censored, there'll be walls. And that's the thing we have to fight against because you're totally right, I think that the best health information is power. Is, actually, I have to tell you, Steve Jobs was a very dear friend of mine, and he was a revolutionary. And I, I don't know if you remember the, the time at the Olympics where people were, were saying, you know, uh, uh, freedom and power. Mm -hmm. And he, he quoted this idea of freedom of the press belongs only to the person who owns a press. Mm -hmm. And he thought that he would bring power to the people by putting a desktop computer on everybody's desk. I mean, that was really, deep down, his motivating force. And if you read Walter's book, you'll see some, some references to that. Bringing a, a computer to everyone's desk is synonymous now with bringing the internet to everyone's desk. And I think we'll get the computer, I think you'll get the broadband access, but I'm very worried about the balkanization of the internet. But don't you think the next generation will override that with some international system? The I technology so. will figure out a way to uh, override those I, local I, systems? I, I hope so. Esther. There's a lot in satellite technology going on if you're following yeah. that, but right. um, I hope so. Yeah, we, um, we're going to have to close soon. I, I really want to take the prerogative to ask um, you three remarkable uh, leaders, really, to all of us in this room and everyone here at Spotlight Health. What, what are you hopeful about related to this topic right now? And let me start with you, Michael. I think it, it's, it's you know, people like Esther who are thinking big and who, who recognize that, they're, that, that so many things in our lives are interrelated, that what we do in health affects what happens in education, what happens in education affects our, our incomes and going into the future, our lifestyles, the fulfillment of our dreams. But recognizing all of that comes uh, is interrelated and not addressing problems anymore just in discrete silos. So that's, that's what I think is the, you know, the, the digital natives, you know, just see the world in, in such a different way and, and all the connections that are out there that need to be made in order to make progress on the planet. So that, I think, is, is a very hopeful thing for me. That's great, Michael. Donna? I think um, I'm hopeful because of the next generation. I've spent much of my career educating them um, all over the world, and I just, I just think it's an extraordinary generation, and that they're going to create a very different kind of world. They're going to take advantage of technology mm -hmm. to bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be different kinds of leaders, so I'm really hopeful. I'm very positive about the next generation, and maybe it's because I've hung out on college campuses <laughs> for so long, and I'm used to talking to teenagers, but yeah. I just think it's a, that the future is very bright. I'm worried about balkanization. I'm worried about the same things that Larry, but I do think we're going to overcome them. Yeah, that's great. Larry, what are you hopeful about? I think we've had a hell of a great week. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think if you think about the Pope's that's encyclical... Right. <laughs>
We've had the Pope's encyclical, which has put a, a, a moral imperative behind the things that all of us value the most. We've had a Supreme Court decision, which allows at least six million people in the United States to have health care and probably affects by ripples 13, 14, 15 million people. We now have a map where we used to have a map that says gay marriage is legal here and here and here and the gray area represented the states that were legal. The whole country is now gray. We've legalized love in all kinds. And we've, we've seen a flag which is a symbol of divisiveness lowered by the people who own the flag. It wasn't imposed from outside. I think we've had a terrific week, a wonderful week, a week for freedom and justice, and I'm very optimistic because yeah. of that. And, and Larry, yeah. One of the things about each of these things that have happened is they've happened from the most conservative elements of our society. That's what I mean. Yeah. It hasn't come from the right. most progressive elements. Yeah. It's come from the Catholic Church, the Supreme Court of the United States, right. and a Southern state. You got it. You, you got to be hopeful. You That's right. Be hopeful. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you.